Hi, I'm Joe Eager with Dow AgroSciences and going to go over uh, some more information on the uh, superfamily Pentatomoidea. Uh, what I'm going to start with is a key to the families of interest and I'll tell you how I got there and then we'll go over some of the different taxa and, and some of the literature in, in this presentation. Um, I was given a list of PPQ interceptions since 1995, and uh, there were a total of about 299 species and seven families on that list. Uh, obviously, some were intercepted a lot more often than others. Um, there's also a, a very good reference uh, by Schaefer and Panisi that lists the pentatomoids of economic importance. And uh, in this, they list five families that have major pests and about 43 species of major pentatomoid pests of crops around the world. Um, and then they also have a number of minor pests. Now, I didn't include all of the minor pests, but I did include the minor pests in this, this listing uh, if they were also intercepted. So if we have a minor pest that's also been intercepted, it's included. Uh, and then there are a few uh, uh, major pests uh, that, that uh, have, have come on lately. Um, there are some non-intercepted major pests, 25 species about, that were not intercepted. Uh, in about five families, uh, and we've got uh, uh, who knows how many other species or families have the potential to become pests. But uh, in, in order to narrow this down a bit, this is this is how I, I came up with with a list of, of things to present to you. Uh, the, the families of Pentatomoidea are listed here, uh, and there are quite a few of them. But an awful lot of them are are going to be very minor families, or either uh, you know geographically quite restricted, very rare bugs, they don't come to light, they're in the deep forest, unlikely to be encountered in, in, uh, in uh, commerce. Uh, and so I've uh, narrowed it down to this, this list here. Uh, aphylids, canopids, certichords, lestoneids, megaridids, phloeids, which was on the previous slide, thalmostelids, and urostilids were not intercepted, never intercepted in any of these in that list. They also don't include pest species, and I know them to be fairly secretive bugs that don't come to light uh, and are, are not likely to be encountered. So I'll mention them briefly, but I don't think you need to worry about keying these or, or that we're going to find these intercepted at, at, uh, at ports. Um, the aphylids, the lestoneids, and the thalmostelids are old world. Aphylids and lestoneids are restricted to Australia. These are very rare in collections, and I didn't even have any to take pictures of. So very unlikely that they'll ever show up in, in commerce. Phloeids, which you saw on the previous slides, a very flat bug. It's on the bark of trees and deep in the Amazonian rainforest. And during the daytime, it gets down to the base of trees. It doesn't come to light. I doubt it would ever show up in, in commerce. Certichords, you see one of them here. Again, very rare bugs. Uh, they are collected a little more than some of these others, but uh, they're deep in the forest. They don't come to light, and, and likelihood of them showing up is pretty minimal. A couple of other families, canopids and megaridids, little black bugs. Uh, they're very active, uh, but they feed on fungus. At least canopids do. We suspect megaridids probably do too. Uh, and they're found only in, in wet forest uh, and feeding on fungus on dead trees. Uh, they don't, you know, megaridids occasionally come to light, but they not typically at light. So again, it's hard to believe that they would show up in, in commerce. And then the urostilids don't include any uh, pest species, and they're also uh, fairly uncommon, and none were intercepted. So these families uh, I, I've not included in this section. So what I called families of interest to, to uh, inspectors are Acanthosomatidae, Sydnidae, Dinodoridae, Pinotomidae, Platospidae, Scutellaridae, Tessertomidae, Thyreochordae. Either because these families have representatives that have been intercepted or because there are some fairly major pest species. What I'd like to do now is take you through a key to the families of Pinotomoids, and in doing so we'll look at some of the characters <coughs> that are key uh, for, for these different taxa. Um, and this is a, a key that, that I put together based on, on literature, uh, so there's no, no real reference to it. Uh, so the first thing we'll look at is whether the antennae are four or five segmented, and that's a uh, fairly easy observation. There actually are some examples that are three segmented, uh, again, groups not likely to be encountered. 
if you do encounter one that's three segmented, you'll want to key it out under the five segmented uh, part of this couplet. So going to the four segmented, uh, attacks with four segmented antennae. If the tarsi are two segmented and the scutellum is, is greatly enlarged, like you see here, uh, reaching or nearly reaching the, the end of the abdomen, uh, the group uh, that you've got there is a platyspid. And uh, again, these have not been intercepted, but uh, Megacopta is a fairly major pest in the southeast and has been intercepted in Central America on shipments out of the southeastern United States. Uh, so, so you'll want to keep your eyes out for that. <coughs> If the tarsi are three segmented, we go to couplet three. Uh, tibia either with very stout spines or with uh, relatively thin CD. And if you're just looking at, at uh, uh, one bug, you may see some, some uh, CD that look fairly heavy, like you see here in, in, in this, uh, on this leg. Uh, but they really need to be very stout and, and, and long, like you see here. If you do have those uh, in, a four, in a bug with four segmented antennae, uh, it's going to be a sydney. Uh, the next couplet, uh, if you don't have the, the spines on the legs, you either have uh, a reticulate venation in the membrane or you have parallel simple venation and that separates the families Dinodoridae from Tessarotomidae. And it pretty much takes care of the, the groups with four segmented antennae. So now we move to groups with five segmented antennae. And the first thing we'll look at is whether they have two segmented tarsi, as you see here, or three segmented tarsi. A among the uh, pentatomoids with, uh, with uh, uh, two tarsal segments, there really are, are three families of interest. One is platyspids, that's couplet six here. The scutellum is enlarged, covers most of the abdomen, and reaches nearly to the posterior end of the, of the abdomen. You've got a platyspid, and you've seen this before. They can be either, have either four or five segmented antennae. If the scutellum is smaller, it tends to be triangular or even if enlarged, but doesn't reach the end of the abdomen and, and leaves a lot of the rest of the uh, hemolytra exposed, uh, you go on to couplet seven. And here we separate uh, the acanthosomatids from the pentatomoids. We mentioned in an earlier presentation the pendergrass organ on females. It's this uh, kind of oblong shape here that's sometimes pretty difficult to tell, but if you've got that, or if you've got males and you've got the A segment visible, uh, you have an acanthosomatid. These bugs also frequently have a very large medial keel or uh, expansion of the, uh, of the, uh, the sternum, and, uh, and that's fairly distinctive as well. Um, if the prosternum either doesn't have that median keel or you don't have the organs or the, the eighth uh, sternite present, uh, then you've got a pentatomid, pentatomidae. Now, bugs with three segmented tarsi and five segmented antennae, uh, we'll key out, we'll start with eight, a couple at eight, and uh, first thing you're asked is whether they have these stout spines or not, we talked about that earlier. Um, if they've got stout spines, we go on to couple at nine, and if not, we go to couple at ten. So let's assume they've got large stout spines, uh, you go to couple at nine, and here we separate the thyreocordae from the sydnidae. Both have the, th the stout spines, but if you look at the, uh, the four tibia on thyrea cords, it's cylindrical, it's not modified for digging. We'll still have spines, but, but it's quite a bit different from sydnids. The sydnids, the four tibias either cultrate or it's expanded uh, and, and for digging. Uh, the other thing, thyrea cords usually have an enlarged scutellum that, that covers most of the abdomen and sydnids have a more triangular scutellum that does not cover the abdomen. Um, okay, we'll go to the bugs without the spines now, a couple at 10. And if you've got a scutellum that covers most of the abdomen, as you see here, um, and you have paired trichobothria, then, uh, then you have scutellaria, family scutellaridae. If the scutellum's not enlarged, or if it's enlarged and reaching the end of the abdomen, but the pair, the trichobothria are single, then you go on to number 11. Uh, as you look at the spiracles on the second abdominal sternite, sternite the first visible, and uh, here you see the uh, spiracle is visible on that sternite. This is family Tessarotomidae. If they're not visible, they're probably still present, but they're covered by the posterior margin of the metapleuron. 
And here you can see a thin sliver that is that second abdominal sternite first visible, and the spiracles are not, not visible. That's the case you go on to couplet 12, which separates denodorids from pentatomids. And basically, denodorids have a very reduced bucula, uh, and it's very truncate at the posterior margin. Uh, now, you can have a truncate, uh, have truncate buculi in the pentatomids, but generally it's much longer. It's not reduced like you see here with denodorids. Sometimes it's completely reduced, as we mentioned earlier, in the acepines or the predators, but then you have a very stout rostrum that uh, hangs out away from the body and is not, not between the buculi. So either of these conditions, then you have the family pentatomidae. Um, now, I went through, I, I mentioned some of this earlier, but uh, I've got a few spreadsheets to show you. And uh, uh, the following slides have spreadsheets that uh, list pentatomoid species that are of greater interest than, than most of the others, I guess. Uh, the bugs that made it onto this list were uh, species that were intercepted 20 or more times, and that's using the PPQ Pentatomoidia pest query from 1995 to February of 2013. Or they were listed as major pests by Schaefer and Panisi uh, in the uh, book Economic, uh, Heteropter of Economic Importance. Or they were intercepted and listed as minor pests by Schaefer and Panisi, or they've become major pests since 2000. And uh, both Halliomorpha hallies and uh, Megacopter carbaria would fit this latter category. Uh, at the end, I will go over a list of literature available for identification of these species. And these spreadsheets are going to be a little bit of, a, of an eye chart, and I don't want you to spend a lot of time on it, but I wanted to capture them so you'd have them available. Uh, you'll notice, if you look over here at the right-hand column, that there sometimes are uh, bugs with no interceptions, but generally they're uh, pests. For example, Microporus nigritus, uh, many crops reported uh, pests, um, and so it's a it's fairly major pest and so I've included it here. Uh, on the other hand, I've got some bugs uh, like Pangeus bilineatus that's uh, been intercepted, intercepted a lot of times. It's a fairly minor pest, but it's been intercepted a lot, so it's on the list. So you can go through and look. You'll see some that were intercepted only a few times, uh, less than 20, but they are a pest of, of some crop. And we're gonna look at uh, a number of these uh, when we go through and, and key these bugs uh, later. Uh, again, a list, uh, this is, these are pentatomids, and you'll see the list of pentatomids is quite long, contains a number of things. For example, alia species, a number of these are pests of grains, and one of them has been intercepted regularly, but the rest have not. Um, but they're, they're all on the list because of their pest status. Uh, there are an awful lot of things on this list that are U.S. species, and so not of, of regulatory concern, uh, but that were intercepted a number of times. I think a lot of these probably come to lights, and so they may be at lights at the ports or at airports, places where, uh, where cargo gets inspected, and they may it be incidental uh, introductions into that at the, at the port uh, uh, where the material is examined. Uh, pentatomids continue. There are an awful lot of pentatomids that, that meet these criteria. <coughs> And, uh, and so you can look through these. The Nazar viridula was the number one intercepted pentatomoid with uh, 1,131 interceptions. Uh, this is, uh, I think, the number of times it was intercepted. Uh, and it feeds on numerous crops. This thing is African in origin and was spread uh, many years ago. It's, it's global now in tropical and subtropical areas. Uh, Pentatomidae, uh, again here, and then the Scutellaridae. Uh, there weren't a lot of Scutellarids intercepted. You can see very few interceptions down here of, of Scutellarids. But this bug, uh, Urogaster integriceps, is a major pest of cereals in southern Europe and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of other Ur uh, Urogaster species that are very important. Uh, so they're in included here as is uh, Pachycorus klugei, which is a, a pest of some tree crops in the tropics. And Tatara bipunctata, it's a U.S. species, but a uh, major pest of, of pine orchards. And then we have a few other families, uh, Dinodorids, Platasmids, Thyreocords, Tesseratomids. You'll notice that Dinodorids, Platasmids, Tesseratomids were not intercepted. 
Thyrea cords, there were a number intercepted, uh, so they're included, um, but they're not pests. I, I don't know of any thyrea cords that are pests. On the contrary, there are a number of pests in these other groups that, uh, that haven't been intercepted, but are included here because of their pest status. I, I uh, grouped the literature resources for identifying Pinotomoidia by the taxon. Maybe I should have done it by author or something else, but uh, it's done by taxon here. And so you can see there are uh, a number of good papers. The Acanthus somatids, there's a key to the world genera. Uh, and so you can get them to genus at least uh, using Kumar's keys. Uh, Don Thomas did a very nice job with the old world asapine and the new world asapines. Uh, these are all of the uh, 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 predatory species, so all of the predators are good keys for both the old and new world uh, uh, species to genus. Um, there are a number of sydnid keys and, and references for identifying sydnids. Unfortunately, they're all uh, uh, restricted in some way. Uh, Linivori has a key to the uh, West, Central, and Northeast African taxa. LIS provides reviews of both Oriental and Australian taxa, and then Froschner has a, a, a very good paper on the sydnids of, of the Western Hemisphere. Um, and it's a little outdated, but you can see anything you're going to intercept would probably still be identifiable using Froschner. Uh, Duray revised the Dinodorids of the world. Um, Larry Ralston has a lot of different, uh, different papers. Here are the discocephalines, which are subfamilies of pentatomids. It's got a key to genera of, of several groups there. Um, these two uh, references, Schaefer and Panisi, and then McPherson and McPherson, deal with heteroptera of economic importance, uh, the first on a global basis, and the second on uh, North America. Uh, a very good reference is Shue and Slater. It's true bugs of the world. There are keys there to, to get you to uh, to superfamilies, subfamilies, uh, subfamilies, and sometimes tribes, along with uh, a little background information on both. Uh, so this is a very good reference. There are a number of these Fauna of France publications uh, that are good not only for pentatomids but for, for other groups. Um, this one, Rebez, I think I've got one or two other listed later by author. Um, but uh, uh, they do a good job, they provide keys both in English and French usually. Uh, Ralston had a number of uh, papers looking at uh, keys to genera of uh, pentatomy. Uh, there's a catalog by Henry and Froschner. If you've got anything from Australia, Gross's Handbooks of the Flora and Fauna of South Australia uh, can be helpful. Um, there is a handbook for determination of Chinese heteroptera, uh, and then uh, again, another one of the, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, this is a catalog of heteroptera, the Paleoarctic region. There's one catalog and then there's a supplement, as you see here. Uh, another paper by Ralston and McDonald um, with keys and diagnos diagnoses for families, subfamilies, tribes of uh, New World pentatomoids. Um, and then, uh, there aren't many good references for the family Scutellaridae. Um, there's uh, a number of uh, faunistic papers that, that are useful, uh, but generally fairly restricted in scope. This paper by Schutaden is, is old, and the higher categories have changed, but really it's still a pretty good reference for identifying uh, bugs to genus. So you can, you can still use this. Um, and then for tesseratomids, there is a key to one of the subfamilies uh, by Kumar. And the thyrea cords were revised by McCady and Malik, and, and that's still a fairly uh, uh, reliable reference. Finally, online uh, resources, you can find an awful lot here at this uh, NDSU uh, pentatomid website uh, put together and, and, uh, and run by David Ryder at, at, uh, at North Dakota. And the photos were all taken by me, uh, so, uh, and then the list of collaborators are given here. With that, I'll take any questions. So why are some of these insects black while others are very colorful? A lot of these insects, if they're, if they're diurnal, 
or camouflaged or, or different, have different colors that may blend in with a host plant. There are a few that are aposematic uh, with, with uh, very pretty colors. Uh, but I think the, the black bugs are generally those that are either live in the ground or they're nocturnal. And uh, this is kind of important from a regulatory standpoint because if you've got a black bug, there's a better chance that it's nocturnal, which means it would come to lights. And uh, like the sydnids, sydnids come very readily to lights because they're nocturnal. They live underground. They only come out at night. And so they tend to gravitate towards light. Whereas something that's diurnal out only in the daytime would be quiescent and probably wouldn't show up at lights. Um, about the humeral spines, why do stink bugs have so many? Stink bugs do. A lot of them do have pointed and very sharp humeral spines. Uh, if you look at the scent opening, the osteol, or, uh, scent osteol on the metathoracic segment, many times it's angled so that it actually shoots out right to where those spines are. So, and this has happened to me many a time, you grab that bug too tightly, you'll break your skin and, and that material will squirt into the cut and it really burns. So envision a lizard or a snake or a bird or something grabbing them and s them squirting out that liquid and it's, it's very offensive and, and, uh, and it burns. Also it's, it's bad if it gets in your eye, but the spines are there I think to give it a, a, a better avenue into a break in your skin and, and again it's a protective thing. 